Welcome back to Taxes Made Simple. I'm your host, Carlton Dennis, and in today's video, we're gonna be talking all about how Al Capone got caught with tax evasion. Al Capone was one of the most infamous, one of the most notorious criminals in American history, but it wasn't his violent crimes of which there were many that got him sent to prison. It was his taxes. And I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know about how Al Capone got caught with tax evasion because it's a wild, wild story and because it's a cautionary tale that everyone who values their freedom should know about. So let's dive in. All right guys, the first thing we're gonna do is dive into Al Capone's background. We have to know his backstory. Al Capone was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1899 to an Italian immigrant parents. When he was just 14, he was already expelled from school for punching a teacher in the face, okay? So this is who we're dealing with, guys. After he got expelled from school, he became involved in several gangs in the Brooklyn and the Manhattan area, including the Bauer Boys, the Brooklyn Rippers, and the Five Points Gang. When Al was just 20 years old, he moved to Chicago, and he started working for a crime boss named Johnny Torrio. While working for Torrio, Al Capone helped him run illegal sides of Torrio's business. He started building the empire. This included things like alcohol smuggling, prostitution, gambling, and Al Capone thrived in the Prohibition area, which lasted from 1920 to 1933. During this time, alcohol was illegal in the United States, and after learning the ropes of Torrio's crime empire, Al Capone eventually ended up taking over Johnny Torrio's Chicago outfit in 1925, following an attempt on Torrio's life. Torrio nearly escaped death, and after deciding to retire after this incident, he gave over full control to Al Capone. Capone proved to be an extremely capable leader and a businessman in the criminal world. In fact, his bootlegging operations and other illegal businesses helped him to achieve a net worth of around $100 million at the height of his power, with adjusted inflation would come out to around $1.5 billion today. In the 1920s, Al Capone gained a reputation for being one of the most violent and most dangerous gangsters in the country. He organized the St. Valentine's Day Massacre on February 14th, 1929, which resulted in the murders of seven members of a rival gang rung by the Bugs Moran. However, despite the fact that Al Capone was frequently involved in illegal activities, violent crimes, he routinely escaped being put in prison for long periods of time. This is mostly because he frequently bribed government officials, he intimidated witnesses, and also he had an elaborate network of hideouts that he would use whenever he needed them. Following the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, Al Capone was named public enemy number one on the Chicago's Crimes Commission's list, and it was, he was the top public enemy. This list would later be adopted by the FBI and go on to become the FBI's most wanted list. However, despite being at the top of this list and one of the most wanted men in the country, law enforcement was having an incredibly difficult time getting Capone arrested and sentenced to any lengthy terms in prison. This is why it surprisingly turned to tax evasion as a method to bring down Capone. This idea was first put forth by Assistant Attorney General Mabel Walker Wilbrandt who realized that mob leaders never filed tax returns despite earning enormous incomes and living lavish lifestyles. Law enforcement officials started to embrace the tax evasion approach because they realized that they could convict Capone on tax evasion without having to convict him for his other crimes. He would end up in jail for a long period of time convicted on tax evasion, and that was good enough for the government. The precedent for this case was set in 1927 when a South Carolina bootlegger named Manley Sullivan was successfully prosecuted for tax evasion for his illegal bootlegging income. In this case, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. ruled that the Fifth Amendment does not protect people from having to report and pay taxes on illegally obtained income. So, in the aftermath of the Manley Sullivan case, the government decided to go after Capone for tax evasion. The federal government used the IRS to spearhead the effort to successfully prosecute Capone. The evidence came next. The most important thing that the IRS needed to convict Capone on for tax evasion was evidence of his income. Once they had that evidence, they could prove that Capone was evading taxes because he never filed tax returns. In fact, regarding his lack of income tax return filings, Al Capone once famously said, they can't collect legal taxes from illegal money. It was this line of thinking that led directly to Capone's demise. In order to dig up evidence of Al Capone's illegal business income, the IRS put a man named Frank J. Wilson in charge of the special investigation unit assigned to Capone's case. 
Finding evidence of Capone's income was particularly difficult because Capone and his leadership team were very smart at hiding money in a variety of different ways. But eventually, however, Wilson and his team were able to track down enough evidence of Capone's income. The chief among the evidence were three ledgers that were seized from one of Capone's gambling establishments in Cicero that detailed the amounts of money being paid to Capone and a letter that was actually given to the IRS from Capone's own attorney, Lawrence Matingley. As Al Capone saw other gangsters and bootleggers being brought down for tax evasion, such as Manly Sullivan, Capone tried to figure out how to prevent the same thing from happening to him. One day in 1929, Capone had his tax attorney Matingley meet with Wilson to discuss some sort of an agreement. During this agreement, Matingley accidentally gave Wilson incriminating evidence against Capone. Matingley wrote down the amount of income that Al Capone was willing to pay income taxes on for the last six years. He gave the letter to Wilson. This letter, later known as the Matingley letter, would be used throughout Capone's eventual trial to prove Capone's income between 1924 and 1929. Now, on October 17, 1931, Al Capone was convicted to five counts of income tax evasion and was sentenced to 11 years in prison in addition to six months for being in contempt of court at an earlier date which was to be served concurrently. He was also fined 50 grand and forced to pay $7,692 for court fees. And additionally, he was held liable for about $215,000 plus interest and back taxes. Al served his prison sentences in several different prisons in America, including the famous Alcatraz prison off the coast of San Francisco that we're very familiar with. However, his health began to deteriorate rapidly when he was in prison due to a serious case of syphilis. So, this significantly degraded his mental faculties. After serving seven years, six months, and 15 days in prison, Al was released early from prison due to his failing health. He also paid off all his back taxes and fines that were owed. He lived out the rest of his days in a state of constant ill health, and he eventually died in 1947 of a stroke and pneumonia. What can we learn from Al Capone? Guys, there are so many lessons that we can learn on his life that can teach us things. The many lessons that crime doesn't really pay. However, there are also lessons we can learn from a taxation standpoint. The first is that the idea that illegal income is not subject to income taxes is completely untrue. Al Capone believed this and he was subsequently brought down by the IRS, the law enforcement agency that he was ironically probably the least afraid of. The next important lesson that we can learn from Al Capone's tax situation is guys that it's crucially important to pay income taxes each and every single year if we make income levels that are high enough to meet the IRS's guideline criteria for taxation. If you choose to just not file your tax returns like Capone, many other tax evaders have done this throughout history. There is a very good chance that the IRS will catch on to you at some point in time. Of course, the odds of the IRS catching on increases dramatically if you are a famous crime lord worth a hundred million dollars. But Al Capone did everything that he could to try to hide his income from the IRS. But when they put a dedicated team of agents on his case, they started to find all sorts of evidence. So the last thing that you can learn from Al Capone about taxes is that even if you think the IRS will not be able to find your income, there's a very good chance that they still may find it. They have many highly trained agents on their staff and it's far safer to simply pay your taxes up front than risk prison by trying to evade them. Guys, that's all for you on this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any tax situations that you need help with or if you have tax questions that you need answers to right now, feel free to get in touch with my tax company by visiting the links below to schedule a complimentary consultation. If you also would like to schedule any time to discuss your real estate investments or if you'd like to get coaching on how to leverage real estate to reduce your taxes, feel free to visit the link below to our tax alchemy course. I have current students in there right now who are learning how to invest in real estate and leverage the tax laws to the fullest extent. And I look forward to seeing you on the inside. Cheers.